Hello, recorders. I'm reporting to you live from LA Comic Con 2021. It's been amazing coming back to this show, and it's recording time! So, are you guys ready to meet the cast of Movie Tour? All right, before we do that, I'm going to introduce you guys to your moderator for this panel. Please welcome her back to the stage, your creator of a history of the Batman. Please welcome London Jackson back to the stage. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I am so excited because... You know, here at LA Comic Con, we get to celebrate so much pop culture and movies and just amazing television. So I am stoked to be moderating this Boy Meets World panel with some of the original cast of the acclaimed 90s series. So let's just welcome them out. We have William Daniels, <laughs> and we have Bonnie Bartlett, we have Ryder Strong, and we have Will Fidel. So, um, I think they're all going to come out here now. Oh, here we go. There's Ryan Shaw. <laughs> Will Fidel. Oh, and we have William Daniels coming. Iconic. <laughs> and we have Barney Bartlett. So thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. For coming. This place is huge. Whoops, careful. So, how are you guys doing today, first off? Good. Good? Yeah. I'm you happy to be here in front of all of these fans? Yeah, this of place is huge. World. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> it's so bright. <laughs> So we are all huge fans of the series, and why do you think just now, today, that Boy Meets World is still such a favorite TV series for people discovering it now and who watched it when it originally aired? What do you think was the spark that really made that series resonate with so many people? Wow. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's something that we've talked about over the years because it kind of surprises us that it's lasted this long. Um, I remember when the show ended uh, in 2000, I, I went to college in New York and I was you know, taking a break from acting and I was sort of like, oh, now I can, can just go be a normal college student and keep my head down. And then the show started airing on Disney Channel and I would get on the subway at like 2.30 in the afternoon when all the schools in New York would get out and the kids would just be like, ah! And I was like, oh my God, it's like more popular now than yeah. when we were on the air, mm -hmm. which was really weird. And it, yeah, it has it has maintained a presence. I, I, I think, I mean, my theory is that, um, well, I mean, I give a lot of credit to Bill. I think that the character of Mr. Feeney uh, is... And I, I think, I think... The, you know, it, it, the idea that the show was uh, important, that it took itself seriously, it, it was always a funny show, and it had a lot of ridiculous, crazy things in it, mostly done by this guy. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was absurd, but then it had so much heart, and, you know, it took things seriously, like the Corey Topanga relationship, the Sean and Angela relationship, and, the, and Mr. Feeney always sort of saying, like, hey, you know, this is... Be a good person, dream, try, do good, you know, the, those messages, um, it made for a, a kind of a schizophrenic show, <laughs> like it's, it's really funny at times and it's really dramatic, and I think at the time that made it kind of a, a weird show, but it's, it's lasted longer than a lot of other of the kid sitcoms from that era, because a lot of the other kid sitcoms were much more like, eh, let's make fun of our teachers and get in trouble, and it was just sort of like making a joke out of being a kid, and Boy Meets World didn't. Uh, and I, I don't know, that's my theory at least. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I, I think a lot of it also had to do with Corey and Topanga. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody wanted to watch the show and then meet the love of their life when they were five. Um, which is, happens all the time. Crazy. It never happens. So, 
Um, I think people like that are kind of it was that idealist, you know, kind of yeah. young love dream, which yeah. which people liked. But I also think um, like anything that lasts, it's it comes down to uh, to the writing a lot when it comes to television shows or movies that people want to continue to watch and that um, still hold up. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with the writing and the stories. And, and they do, they get absurd at times. I mean, when you find yourself in a couch um, <laughs> or, or like in a, lobster, a, a lobster, lobster outfit, but then you'd be like an alcoholic for an episode. <laughs> two episodes. Um, two episodes. Join a cult for one you episode. You joined a cult at one point. So we never knew what we were kind of walking into where it was like, oh, Sean's an alcoholic for six pages. Um, what was the craziest thing for you? Like the craziest Eric moment as far as an outfit or a thing you had to do? Plays with squirrels was pretty <laughs> <laughs> That was, so was pretty crazy. There's a scene of some Plays with Squirrels right there holding up the secret of life. Yes. Um, Plays with Squirrels was, was pretty the crazy. The most out there? No, the most out there, I think, is the episode where Corey is, or where Eric is stalking Topanga, so he's like always in, he's in the trunk of the tree, and then he's in the couch at the end, and um, yeah, it was weird, but they always had like, we always called it the two Boy Meets World, because there was one show where it was Ryder and Ben and Danielle and Trina, and then it was kind of myself and Matt Lawrence and Maitland, and we all did it was like you guys had this dramatic kind of like and then it was like cutting to us to do the wacky stuff yep um and i always tell people when there was an episode that was about eric that was the week that ben savage had his finals um <laughs> so it was like hey ben's taking his sats i get a show uh, <laughs> so it was uh yeah it was it was certainly interesting but that was the the weirdest thing you were an alcoholic i was a couch that's what they did <laughs> I, I can't speak yeah, go ahead. No, uh, I just think that, what? Uh, I, no, it is amazing to Bill and me that so many people think of Mr. Feeney as a, a role model, as, no, as, as, as a grandfather, really, as, as a man who... They, they still want his advice, and they want him to give the advice that he gave to people on the show. And so many years later, it just appalls Bill. He really doesn't understand it. <laughs> but, but he does it, and he does a lot of cameos for people, and people want advice. They want, and they want Mr. Feeney's advice. So he repeats many of the things that he did on the show. And uh, it's great, and it's it. At his age, he's so happy to have it. So happy to have it. Right. Right. So speak. What? Can you say that? Did I say what? Say that. Say what? Say something. Say something. Say something. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> They met when they were five years old <laughs> in a sandbox. In a sandbox. <laughs> well, since we love to praise Mr. Feeney because he's an amazing actor, character, and he, you guys basically, you grew up with him on the series, so can you talk a little about a bit about the experience you had working with him and throughout the seasons and just kind of how maybe your bond grew with him on the screen and off the screen and how that made the series itself just a stronger... Well, for the first three seasons, we thought he was British. <laughs> that is not a joke. We honestly thought he was British. Uh, he wasn't. Um, but it, it was one of those things where we all... I know now, as an, an adult actor, I thank God that we got to kind of grow up around Bill as yeah. actors. Um, because he's the was a, you know is a consummate professional. He was never late, never dropped a line. He always knew his parts. He always, so it kind of taught us how to be professional actors. Um, you know, it's, he never treated us like we were kids. We were we were co-stars. Um, so it didn't matter that you were 11, 12, 13 years old. You had you had a job to do. You would work. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful way to learn how to become a professional actor. I mean, at least for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You know, I, I didn't really know who Bill was when we started, and, and our executive producer's name was Michael, and uh, so during one of the note sessions, I heard Bill say, now, Michael, and I was like, you, that's your kid, you were a kid. That's all I cared about. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, no, he, uh, you know, Bill, when you're, when you're on a sitcom, uh, you, the, they rewrite the script every night. And so we would never memorize our lines until the very last minute. But Bill would show up three hours early every day, completely memorized every day. Um, he was just a consummate professional and such a great role model for us. Um, yeah. And we were, you know, we were kids. We were goofing off. Um, but because of Michael, Michael and Bill, there was a real air of like professionalism on our set that I, I don't think a lot of other kids shows had. I don't no, know. I, would, I would agree. It was a kind of crazy, and there was also a, a real emphasis um, within the show on education and schooling, and that also bled into the set. You know, we had amazing studio teachers. They gave a lot of like, like, uh, you know, Will made the joke, but it was actually part of this. The, it, when Ben had finals, he got the week off. <laughs> because it was really important that he did well in school. And the show, you know, when I graduated high school, uh, I went to the producer because I wanted to go to college. And they gave me every morning off to go take classes at Occidental here in LA uh, while still working on the show. They, they worked the whole schedule around allowing me to go to college, which, you know, they didn't have to do. I was under a six year contract on Boy Meets World. They didn't have to do that. Uh, but, you know, they were accommodating our education. And it was a really, really great environment. I agree. Sure. It's amazing to see how grown up they've become. <laughs> because when we did the show, they were really young teenagers. And uh, I've got to say, they were very well behaved. And uh, I would stay in my dressing room because they fooled around a lot. <laughs> and until they got serious, then would come out, I'd come out and we'd do a scene for the show. And I, then I'd go back into my dressing room. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think my, one of, a lot of my fondest memories of the show were scenes that Eric and Mr. Feeney had together. Um, because they weren't supposed to be together. It was supposed to be Corey and Mr. Feeney together. So the idea of Eric and Mr. Feeney together was so absurd that it could never work. And then you put them together, and for some reason it just did, weirdly. Um, so well, it was the ultimate straight man. Yeah, you know? it was just, yeah. And you would just be doing these insane things, and Bill would never break a smile. I don't think so I cracked funny. him one time. Not <laughs> one time do I think I got him to laugh. Uh, but it was... Uh, and that, But again, it's not to say he was stern on the set, because he wasn't. He was a joy to work with. But it was just... It was different generations working together. We certainly had them. And that was the thing that was interesting about the show is it really was generational because we had everybody from, you know, Bill to Rusty and Betsy who played our parents to then kind of teachers that were a little younger than that to then us to then Lily Nixon. I mean, we went the, the 14 little sisters we had. Um, <laughs> they just kept changing every week. It's like, what's your name? Hi. Okay, great. Um, I'm kidding. We had two and they were wonderful. Uh, but uh, it was, we kind of hit every generation, which I thought was, was kind of cool. So maybe that's why it still resonates because a lot of the fans that are now watching the show are like under the age of 15, which is really cool. Girl Meets World fans. And Girl Meets World, yeah, that go back to watch Boy Meets World. That yeah. didn't know that there was a, a show beforehand, yeah. But as you were saying, between even Girl Meets World and the original Boy Meets World series, Watching the episodes now, you see a lot of the s themes that and issues that people deal with today. Yeah. Even if it was the show is from the '90s, so it, are there any particular or memorable episodes or scenes that kind of you you would believe still would resonate with people today? Like topics like. Uh, you know, when you were talking about the cult episode, and well, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of different issues that maybe kids growing up were dealing with that maybe they couldn't even talk to their parents about. So sure. are there any episodes or moments that stick out in your mind that you're like, oh, even if it was then or now that audiences could connect with or learn from? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to pin, but Sean went through so much drama. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to pinpoint, but I, I, I think in general, um, you know, the, I, the idea that, that if you come from a family that's 
broken or uh, not supportive in some way, like like Sean did, and that you could have a chosen family, or that you know you could find a friendship that, in in a way, can sort of replace your parents. Um, I feel, I think that was a relatively new idea uh, when we were doing it. Now I feel like that's a little more of a common understanding. Uh, but when we were doing it, you know, I, 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 I really think that that's an important message. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. And the, the sort of bigger message of Boy Meets World overall is that your, your childhood is important and that your, your friends and your boyfriend or your girlfriend and your teacher, like, these, these people are not frivolous, that, that those, uh, those experiences you have and those relationships that you forge and those things will carry through the rest of your life, whether you want them to or not. So you might as well make them good and you might as well take them seriously. And I, you know, I don't think a lot of shows in the 80s were doing that. I don't, you know, that was a relatively new concept. I mean, and now I think that that's more of a given. And I, I think that that's another reason the show has resonated. Um, so I don't know, that's a kind of, I'm sorry to evade, I don't have a particular episode or a particular moment, I mean, but yeah, like, I think that that overall idea of like, hey, take your friends seriously, take your, you know, take your relationships with, you, you know, your teachers and all those people seriously, because it's going to matter. Yeah. It's kind of amazing how people accepted without a question going from year to year to year to year to year, and, and Bill was always the teacher. <laughs> Whether it was it? junior high school, high school, college. Uh, yeah, of course. He, he was just, a star. He was always there. He was, he, was, he was their teacher, and people just accepted that without question. Yeah. And they liked it, and that's it. So, yeah. Well, my teacher from nursery school all, all the way through college is also my neighbor. Isn't that how it Totally works? normal. <laughs> it's completely normal. Uh, no, I, but speaking of school, I mean, the episode that always stuck out for me that I got a lot of letters about was when Eric decided to do what he could to get into college. Um, and then he didn't get in and had to work harder to get in. So I had a lot of people that wrote me kind of saying, I wasn't going to go to college. I didn't think I could get into college. And then I saw that Eric went and I worked harder and I got into college. So I thought that was one that was really cool. And um, adopting Tommy, that's just a personal thing for me, um, uh, was, was an interesting episode. Not that... You know, Eric at 19 should have been saddled with a child, but um, that those were important episodes for us. Yeah, I'm trying to get him to say something about the teachers. All the teachers that asked me for support. You can't say that. Oh, I can. He gets an awful lot of requests for people who say they became teachers because of Mr. Feeney. And uh, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so. He hears from teachers, teachers every day, every day. Somebody who's a teacher, I became a teacher because of you, or I got interested in history because of you and uh, John Adams in 1776. It's, uh, he, he has a way of influencing people. He really does. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I think one of the most memorable moments in the show, oddly enough, was the finale episode. I think that was the most emotional and one of the most touching moments. Um, can you tell us about working on the finale and going back and, and filming and just how that was, kind of wrapping up such an amazing series then in that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it was real life at that point. I mean, it, 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 that, that final scene where we're saying goodbye to Bill was, there was no uh, distinction from Sean and Ryder at that point. I, I'd already, um, I was transferring to go to college in New York, just like the characters were going to New York to go to college. And we were saying goodbye to seven years of friendship and working together, um, terrified about what the future brought, uh, would bring, and... Um, and also kind of happy to be moving on and excited to be moving on. Uh, you know, all those emotions. It was, it was a real, just, it was, it was a lot. And so we did one take of that scene in the classroom saying goodbye to Bill. And I just bawled like a baby. And that was all real. And yeah, uh, you know, it was, yeah, it, it was both awful and wonderful at the same time. And, and when we did the one take, we were, you know, gonna go do another take, and the, the directors were like, "No, we're, gonna, we're just gonna, we're not gonna put these kids through this anymore." 
Uh, so yeah, it's it's pretty raw. I have, I saw it when it aired, and that's the last time I saw it. I can't. I haven't watched it since. I don't think I could. So it was just. It was. It was a. We were. I mean, I imagine shows like Friends or Seinfeld or things like that. When you start as adults and end as adults, that's one thing. And you're still you still get the bond of working together, and you still get the bond of friendship. But when you start as kids and you grow up together, um, and you've got this mentor who's with you the entire time, saying goodbye there takes on an entirely different tone. And it was hard for all of us for all of our different reasons. I mean, we were all different ages. I think I was 24 at the time, 23, and I was the old guy. You know, so it was like <laughs> we were just we, as Ryder said, we were you're you're ready to move on, but you also don't want to move on. It's that feeling of I can't wait to go to college and get out of my house, but I don't want to leave the house. You know, it's that kind of struggle. So, um, yeah, that was real for all of us. And, yeah. and if you go back and you watch the scene, there's mistakes all over the place. I mean, yeah. mistakes yeah. all the time. And, and we couldn't shoot it again. So they just went, let's just air it. That's yeah. fine. Would you comment about the last scene, please? Okay. Uh, you know, Mr. Feeney was a uh, Mr. Feeney was a kind of a strict kind of guy, uh, and um, demanded that they behave and do their work. Um, but the last show we did, they all left the room. And I said uh, to the empty room, I love you all. And that's one of my favorite moments in the play, in the, in the show. Yeah. So after this this long period of time since the show began and just the way that all these people are here now celebrating it did you ever think that it would become practically a phenomenon did you ever think that it would grasp so many people the way that it did when you originally started and are you just just very thankful and grateful that people have connected with a project that you worked on and cared about so much yeah, I mean, what's crazy to think about is, even as kids, I think Will and I already had enough, had been burned enough by Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, but you really, by the time I was 13, I had already done, like, three different TV series that had gotten canceled after the pilot. Or, jaded, totally jaded. Yeah, so I was like, uh, what is this new script? Uh, <laughs> it was called the Ben Savage Project. The untitled Ben Savage they Project. They were building it around Ben. And I remember reading the pilot script and being like, Ugh, I'm the character of Sean, I only have two lines, okay. <laughs> Never thought it would mean anything. We shot the pilot. Even when we did the pilot, I remember having fun, but thinking, well, this show will never get picked up, uh, which is, you know, just crazy. But, you know, you lose perspective. You don't know. As an actor, you just kind of go from project to project, from pilot season to pilot season. And, and um, it really wasn't until uh, Topanga was introduced, which is the episode Corey's Alternative Friends, that was... That was when it felt like something special happened, and I think we all realized it. It was like, oh, uh, and, and what had happened is they had kept trying to find a third best friend. They wanted Corey to have two best friends, and so we always had another kid sitting in the chair in the cafeteria, and we started calling it the death chair <laughs> because they would never be back the next week. And finally, one episode, uh, they fired the kid halfway through the week, and gave me all of his lines. And that was Corey's Alternative Friends episode, and then also introduced Danielle. And she was supposed to only be in the one episode. But, you know, something magical happened. The show came together. And I think part of it was, because the show originally was, was really more, was supposed to more be about the family, and school was kind of gonna be secondary. Uh, the, the, the original pitch for Boy Meets World was, uh, uh, Growing Pains was on the air, and Michael Jacobs said, why don't we do a show that's about the middle brother, as opposed to the older brother, because all the TV shows at the time were always focusing on the older kid. 
So the whole pitch was to be about what it's like to be the middle brother in your family, and also what if your teacher lives next door. So school was kind of just going to be a part of, you know, a sideline. And I, at that moment, the fifth episode, when we were filming it, I think everybody realized, oh, actually, school might be a really big part of the show. And the relationships that Corey has with his friends and his potential girlfriend, and all of that is going to become uh, more, if, as if not more important than the family storyline. And uh, so that was really when I think I realized, like, oh, this could, this could be a thing. And the audience went crazy that night. Yeah. And we just all felt it. We all felt the vibe on set. And then, of course, that, I, that ended up being the first episode that we got uh, a 24 share, which means nothing to anybody now. But back then was a big deal because we used to do these things called Nielsen ratings, which would tell us how many people are watching the show. And uh, you know now it means nothing, but back then that was a big deal. It meant that our show was going to continue, and it was that episode that got our first 24 share. So uh, yeah, then we knew we were on, in it forever. And, and I remember talking to my 13-year-old girlfriend at the time back home because I, I didn't live in Los Angeles. I would come down to work, and I remember being like, "Oh my God, can you imagine if this show goes? I could be 20 when this is over." How, you know, sure enough, it's exactly what happened. It's crazy. Well, I think we're actually a little bit out of time, but I loved hearing from you guys talking about the series. We all love Boy Meets World, and I'm so happy that you all came to talk with us about this amazing series. So thank you so much to Ryder Strong and Will Fidel and William Daniels and Bonnie Bartlett for sitting and talking with us. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And thank you all for coming to the panel.